Good morning. Um, just, um, <clears throat> good morning. Uh, so, as uh, I was introduced, my name is Daniel Antal. Um, I'm uh, originally I was born in Budapest. Uh, I live in the Netherlands, and I work in this uh, region, where company is covering nine countries. And um, I've been working with uh, uh, liberalization and regulated uh, industries all my life. Um, starting with banks when uh, they started to compete with each other, then with railways and um, in the media, and um, eventually in the last couple of years um, in entertainment, mainly music and also in films. Um, the work I will talk about is uh, started as a regional cooperation uh, between uh, three countries. Uh, now more countries were involved, and uh, these are the first uh, results of our work that started uh, quite a while ago. Um, so, <clears throat> let me start where, where the first uh, uh, speakers uh, address this conference about uh, mapping creative and uh, cultural industries. Um, I think um, this is quite an elusive uh, topic. Um, it's sort of a buzzword for a lot of us um, because uh, there was so much talk about it in the last couple of years, but many of us felt that it's not concrete enough. It's not helping to make um, policy decisions. Um, it's not uh, giving us concrete help in our work. Um, why it is so? I will start in a few minutes with a little bit of uh, boring stuff and then I will immediately jump to the results. Um, the problem with uh, creative and cultural industries is that creative people don't really fit into categories. When uh, statisticians are making uh, GDP calculations, employment uh, calculations, they're using a framework uh, that was developed um, in the framework of the United Nations in the 20th century, mainly for manufacturing industries and agriculture. They measure very well how people are creating value in a shipyard or how they are manufacturing cars, but it's not really a measurement for measuring the productivity of musicians, authors. It's not really a measurement for making films. So in 2007, the European Union, just before the big economic crisis, decided that it uh, wants to have a better understanding of creating the industries. It set up a task force of uh, statisticians to actually map the product of these people. There are two problems associated with this. National statistics uh, usually cover companies with more than five people, often more than 20 people. While in creative industries, the average industry size all over Europe is below three people. So creative people usually are freelancers. Creative people are usually working in micro enterprises and they are not part of the national statistical system. They can be only asked in surveys like we're doing in these long and tedious surveys um, because there's no systematic collection of their product. So, to cut the story short, I just uh, want to show you a diagram from a technical report. You will find the references there later, which try to uh, pinpoint where you can find data about creative industries. And you can find that in so many boxes, even though the most small enterprises are not even there, um, this arrow downstairs is uh, live music, which will be very important for us. Then we have sound recordings and also radio and television near us. But it's a little bit mixed. Live music is mixed in the statistical systems with theatrical uh, productions. Um, live performance and music are in the same bracket as um, actors in theaters. And sound recordings are often a little bit overlapping with film or television or radio. So we need that kind of mapping that, um, that the intellectual property office is doing with a different methodology, which is comparable to us, and what uh, we're trying to do here. Um, if we're not doing this work, uh, the product, the value added, and the employment effect of uh, the music industry will not be visible. So I repeat, this data is not existing in government uh, uh, statistical systems, we have to come together and create those, and we have to participate in these voluntary surveys because the mandatory surveys do not cover these issues. Um, 
this is a data map. You don't really have to read the text. This just shows um, how many different boxes we need to address and where we have to find uh, the people who are working just in the music industry. I use a model that is also used by the European Union's Joint Research Center. It's an American model, actually, which categorizes the music industry into three uh, columns. Um, you can see with the blue column, that is the live music. On the top, you always find uh, the musicians and the stage, the musical works, live performances, downstairs, the audience. And in the boxes, all those organizations from concert promoters, concert halls, um, booking agencies, um, who are contributing to create, adding value to the work of musicians till it uh, reaches the audience and uh, gets paid. Uh, in the middle, there are compositions um, with music publishers and collective right management. And the red column is the participants of the recorded music industry, including record labels, um, distributors, um, also radio and uh, TV programming. So there's a lot of uh, small enterprises, usually employing one, two, three, or four people who are making up this music industry. And musicians usually receive money from 30 to 60 places in a year. So it's very difficult to create this map. And uh, that's what we're trying to do. Um, this map will be available for reference, um, but I will now talk about the results of this work. I just wanted to show you how we're deriving these um, and how many roles we are taking uh, into consideration. Um, we were following about um, 30 roles that musicians uh, and their helpers are fulfilling when they are working uh, and creating music for the audience. And um, these are the results in comparison with the United Kingdom, which has excellent music statistics, and uh, the two other countries that initially started this regional cooperation, Hungary and Slovakia. Um, this is um, the breakup of the revenue of musicians uh, in Croatia and the other countries where they get their money from. In the first column, you can see live music. It, uh, since about 2008, the record industry has lost its flagship uh, role, and uh, live music is the biggest uh, contributor of uh, the income of musicians. You have author's revenue, copyright, uh, as the second biggest. The recorded music is the blue, uh, the green, uh, excuse me, the green one, which is very small, and then we have uh, state and the private donors. Um, you can also see this by institutions. Musicians and their management collects about half of the money individually from venues, from concert halls, from festivals. And then what is very striking, and I think uh, that explains why uh, we're here and working together with these organizations, is that while in the UK the second biggest source of uh, money for uh, musicians are music publishers or music publishers and record labels and a co-publishing deal, um, in Central Europe this role, at least from a monetary perspective, is taken by collective management societies in the absence of uh, strong publishers. It is exactly almost the same amount of money that is paid by uh, uh, HDS ZAMP mainly, and also uh, uh, for producers and uh, performers, their societies. So we have a very different uh, market landscape than in Western Europe and Northern Europe, and I think uh, that requires different solutions, how the industry is structuring itself. Um, this slide, again, is just for reference. You can find it later in the conference. This explains the whole methodology of uh, how we're working. Uh, it was created for a statistical conference, and I don't want to talk about it now, but uh, it's available if you're interested. So I think the first message uh, is that if you want to talk to the government, if you want to have your voice heard in the public, or if you want to have a better deal with um, global companies like Spotify, YouTube, or with the film industry, you have to make yourself visible. And because music and creative 
people and creative output is not well uh, recognized in the statistical systems. Um, the players in the music industry have to organize themselves and have to uh, share and collect data. Uh, the reason why in the Netherlands or even in Germany or Denmark or Norway you can present very well the case for creative industries and the music industry is that usually it is from 16 to 30 uh, industry associations that are organizing those kind of statistical data gathering that we're trying to do here. So I'd really like to invite you to participate in these schemes because uh, um, that's the way to get to these results. And also I'm inviting uh, the conference to discuss the special role that um, collective management organizations play in this uh, region. Um, and uh, also what is the negative side of this that the missing uh, uh, income for local artists, uh, the missing income from music publishers, what it means. I think collective management cannot really substitute music publishers because collective management organizations have to indiscriminately uh, represent foreign and domestic repertoires, their sister associations, so they cannot really promote your music. Uh, it is the role of the music publisher and I think that's a big development task ahead. Um, and that is really missing to reach the level of uh, income that is uh, um, existing in Western Europe. Um, I think uh, this, uh, the next uh, chart is taken from uh, the JESAC study uh, that was uh, uh, produced by uh, Ernst & Young last year about the European employment effect uh, of creative industries. I slightly modified it because it didn't, uh, it uh, combined the performing arts and I took out uh, the music industry. But the music industry is the biggest employer of, out of uh, creative industries in Europe. And it has a significant employment effect on TV broadcasting, radio, um, also advertising and uh, the film industry. Um, and uh, when we're talking about uh, the music industry for the public, I think the most visible players of the industry, of course, are artists. But what is often forgotten that behind the artists, there are a lot of technicians, uh, there are a lot of managers, um, in this survey, we were asking uh, artists how many people are involved in staging their music for live performances. These are the answers. Even part-time musicians usually employ, at least temporarily, um, about uh, four or five people for their shows. On average, a, a musician or a band of musicians uh, employs seven or eight people, so more than the size of the band. But with successful uh, ensembles and bands, uh, you can easily add this up to 25 or even 100. Um, in a big uh, music club, um, to stage a show, it requires about 40 people. In an arena, it can go up to 200. And in a festival where you have temporary installations, it can go up to the thousands. So the music industry is also about them. But they are not so visible because they're behind the stage. Um, and now I would like to talk about a few problems that we would like to address with this uh, study. So to show that if you're willing to participate in it and if you're sharing data with us, we can talk about real life problems. So one big problem of the music industry is that it became so much live music centered, but live music is extremely seasonal. These are Google searches in the past years all over the region for concert tickets. It is well known um, that concerts usually are peaking in a few months, mainly in December, but also uh, in different countries, different times of the year. But that means that all these people have a lot of work to do in certain amounts of time, and then not so much work to do in others. There's a lot of uh, solutions how you can manage this, but I think you first have to measure uh, this properly. In Western Europe, um, they realize that they have to invest more into uh, multi-use uh, cultural facilities that are not only uh, good for music venues. There's a very important role to play for festivals that can bring in the cultural tourists in the summer, and I think Croatia has an exceptionally strong, uh, strong offering uh, for cultural tourism because of the sun and the sea that you have in the summer. And even though it's not necessarily creating a lot of uh, opportunities for musicians, it's actually creating job for those musicians who are working behind them. 
And also, as we will see from the study, a lot of musicians are working as technicians in these occasions. Another issue that is very important to realize is that uh, there's always a, a discussion between concert promoters and the uh, collective management that uh, um, licensing music on stages is very expensive, but or, uh, numbers show, and this is, uh, um, these are numbers I received from Live Nation, which has companies all over the region, that actually the big difference between how much an artist is getting paid in form of royalties and performance fees is not so much depending on collective right management, but on different tax systems. Uh, as you can see, Croatia um, can pay out a lot less from a given sized budget than uh, in most other countries in the region because of the tax system. In Western Europe, it is recognized by most states that the music industry is extremely uh, labor intensive um, because it's already visible how many people work there. And for this reason, it uh, gets a different tax treatment because of its labor intensivity. intensivity. Um, but from a concert here in the region, we pay a lot more taxes. And actually, I think we need to shift the debate between members of the industry like uh, CMOs and concert promoters to involve the state that actually were overcharged. And because there is a very big international competition, especially for cultural tourists and festivals, this makes a huge difference. I mean, festivals can be easily shifted from Croatia to Montenegro, which also has the sea and the sun, or Slovenia, or Italy, or elsewhere, even if you're just thinking about these uh, summer packages. Um, a third issue, um, we also want to survey the audience, and we're looking for partners for that. Uh, this is from a survey um, where I got the data from. It's from a European uh, project. Unfortunately, it's uh, only in every five years. This is the last survey results, which shows the demographics of the audiences across Europe. And you can see that in the region, we are also in the same uh, shoes because we have a very young audience. Um, very young compared to Germany or the Netherlands. Is it a good thing? Well, it's not a good thing because it's not because um, more young people go to concerts in this region. It is because people usually stop going to concerts when they are 31, 32, or 33. Um, it's a big problem. In Germany, the average concert goer is 48 years old. That is when people earn the most money. That is when their children are not so small anymore and they can go to concerts. Um, in this region, it's it's not there, which uh, leads to the fact that uh, young people go only to the shows. They are seeing only young artists. Artist careers are very short. And um, our research is trying to understand this problem, um, also following research from Germany, how you can change this, why people cannot go to concerts. Uh, is it a financial problem? Is it a cultural problem? Is it a logistics because families need cars and parking lots? Is it a mass transit problem? We have a very detailed problem uh, map and also a very interesting model of visits for Slovakia and Hungary, and we would like to do it for Croatia as well, but we need data for that. Um, so all in all, um, live music became so important in the industry in the past seven or eight years but because it's so fragmented, it's, it's not like you have a recording deal and there's a record label that is taking care for your tour, for your distribution. Um, you have to deal with a lot of concert promoters, places, festivals, at least uh, in a year if you're a professional, you're on average uh, play 37 shows just in Croatia and also in the neighboring countries. So um, it's... It's much more fragmented than, than the record-oriented music industry was. And uh, again, I think um, you need to fill out these uh, boring questionnaires. You need to share data in order to have a view and to start to influence these issues like seasonality, cultural, uh, tourism, how we can present more to foreigners, how we can go into more shows abroad. Um, now, talking about the record industry, for historically, in the 20th century, the music industry was equal to the recorded industry because there was so much money in it, and it really organized the way artists made a living. It's not so much so anymore because there's more music in live performances because live performances cannot be uh, pirated. You cannot copy a concert. You can copy a record. 
But still, uh, recorded music is very, very important in music discovery. And of course, you want to get paid for it. At least you want to cover your recording budget. Now again, we're really in the same shoes in this region. Um, I put together the uh, recording industry numbers figures um, for the region and some European countries. And we can see two striking differences. Croatia is on the top of this list with Hungary and uh, Slovakia. First of all, people spend much, much less on uh, recorded music than they do in Western Europe. That's one problem that we have to tackle. But there's another interesting issue is that the record company's income structure is very different. Um, the biggest source of the music industry in this region is collective right management. In this year, I think it will probably reach 50% of the industry income. This means that because consumers do not really pay directly, it is collective management organizations who can make restaurants, hotels, radios, television stations, and certain digital online uh, players pay for the industry. I think this is a very particular problem for Central Europe because in other emerging market markets in Latin America and Asia, you have different forms. So the fact that collective right management uh, is the main income source is only, only uh, can be seen in Croatia, Hungary, Slovakia, to some extent, Czech Republic and Poland and Bulgaria. And I think this also leads to a very different uh, way of how to promote uh, recorded music and how to protect your interests. I think this really calls for national level strategy and digital distribution and also on a regional level because I think as you will see, Croatia is a little bit too small to be a player in this uh, field. For instance, uh, Spotify, which is a big player, um, is not even involved in small markets. And even if you want to discuss things with YouTube, I think you have to have a repertoire that uh, needs uh, at least the full national repertoire. <laughs> Sorry. Several countries. Um, Again, um, we're collecting uh, data about uh, how much it costs to produce a record, how many recordings uh, musicians are make. Um, I do not want to come to conclusions because um, unfortunately I don't have enough respondents so far from Croatia to be comparable with the other countries. But so far it's, it's clearly visible to me that recording budgets are not really recovered. And, uh, just um, let me talk about the differences between uh, Hungary, which is a few uh, years ahead, but not so many years ahead as Sweden or the United Kingdom. In Hungary, musicians actually earn about the same amount of uh, money than Croatian musicians do. Um, this is um, the income structure that is reported to us by musicians in Croatia uh, here which is about half of the income coming from physical sales, then digital downloads, if there are, and those colorful things are uh, SoundCloud, Bandcamp, Deezer, and YouTube. You can see uh, my latest estimate made for artist use um, in Hungary. And then there's a case study uh, which I got from a digital distribution company for a big independent repertoire in Hungary. You can see that it's uh, becoming quickly much more colorful YouTube being the biggest uh, player in this, accounting for about a quarter of the income. Um, and then you can see that these are, even though it has a much smaller market penetration than Spotify, it pays more music than Spotify for the local repertoires um, and so forth. The critical thing to understand here is that uh, in order to make money out of these sources, you have to be an active player of uh, making these markets. Um, in Hungary, Spotify is much more uh, frequently used by consumers than Deezer. I think they have at least six times as many uh, users. Still, it pays less than Deezer. Why? Because it has a very different promotion strategy. Uh, Deezer is looking for these emerging markets and looking for local partners to promote its business, but Spotify is not doing it. So if you don't learn these differences, you will not really be able to sell your music on Spotify. Also, YouTube is really growing fast. I could show you, and if those who are interested, I can show in the coffee breaks, data about how it's taking over radio and television and already in Hungary, and uh, that's happening uh, in the US even faster. But 
you have to learn how to monetize. I mean, in Croatia, you have plenty of content on YouTube, but most of it is not uh, monetized. It's very difficult to understand how it works, and it cannot really contribute to your income. So you really have to create market, and it's not a single market. Spotify is not making money because it's plainly a premium market, um, uh, so it's for free users. Um, but advertisers do not know its uh, audio um, advertisement schemes. They don't know its value, it's not measured, so they're not advertising. And because Spotify offers you to pay 70% of advertisement value, if it's multiplied by zero, then you get zero. Um, but Spotify is not going to make a marketing effort for these small countries, not even Hungary, which is twice the size, and at least they are present. YouTube is sort of a little bit same, there are no real metrics how to measure the impact of uh, uh, music videos, and that's why uh, advertisers are reluctant to put more spending there, even though we can show that uh, for their most important uh, audiences, I could show you results that we hope to replicate in Croatia in the coming weeks. Um, YouTube is actually ahead of television. So YouTube is getting more viewer hours from the critically young groups than television. But since it is not well understood how you can measure its impact uh, and its use, advertisers are reluctant to put more advertising money in it. So you will see that um, this is a, a very colorful and very complex business. It's uh, mainly seen as just an extra to your uh, income structure, but I think all these colorful uh, parts uh, work differently and they are on a sort of different market. I just want to go back to one slide before I conclude. Um, this is taken from Econest. Um, Econest is a database, I'm sure many of you are familiar with, which has data of about 40 million songs. It's uh, not only legal data like the name of the author, but it also has uh, musicological data like uh, the chord progression in the song, uh, the color of the sound, uh, as it is understood by computers, what sort of instruments there are, the danceability of the song, it's BPM, so about 28 uh, characteristics, and it is used to, to predict the, uh, how you can put uh, the song onto a market, and um, these data are taken from them. Uh, Croatia is not in because uh, Econest is owned by Spotify, and uh, since Spotify uh, is uh, not here in the region in all countries, yet we don't have that much uh, data. But it's uh, combining the use of uh, music in many channels, not only on Spotify, in 400 channels, and they are producing two rankings, uh, the hotness and the discovery ranking. The hotness is about the popularity of music, discovery is for new acts, which are not so big, but upcoming. And I put different uh, nations from Europe, how they are doing uh, on, these, uh, on these channels. And you can see that Northern Europe is right up uh, there with uh, a lot of participation, um, a lot of uh, songs coming from Northern Europe, which are also extremely successful for various reasons that we could talk about in these two days. Um, and then you can see Central Europe just down here in Greece. Um, I think it's just not enough to be on these platforms. You have to understand how you can promote your music, and it requires a lot of data. I mean, if you don't know that 28 characteristics of your song, you cannot use those super prediction tools that can tell you in which channel to put your music to make it successful. So um, the main conclusion, and uh, I would like to conclude here, is that um, we really need a lot more data to understand um, and compare ourselves into these other countries because there's an unprecedented level of competition in music. In the record stores, in all the record stores in Zagreb until there were many record stores, if you would, would have bought the whole inventory, you probably would have ended up with owning about 100,000 tracks 10 years ago. Now if you um, subscribe to Deezer or Spotify, you have access to 35 million tracks. So to promote the Croatian songs in that vast repertoire, I think it is extremely important 
to understand how this works and uh, to present yourself better. That is what we're trying to do in this work. And uh, I hope that in this conference we can find new partners for this research. And also I can uh, get a lot of questions how you want to use it so that we can include it into this study. Um, thank you very much. And uh, I give the floor. Thanks.